Hello, everyone. Welcome back for a brand new episode of Collider Connected. It is such an honor to have Delroy Lindo from the Five Bloods on the show this time around. Delroy, huge congratulations. And how are you doing right now? I'm doing all right. I'm doing OK. Thank you. How are you? I am doing quite well because I'm mighty excited to talk to you about your filmography and in particular, The Five Bloods, which we cannot be talking about enough right now. But I warned you, we like to go back to the beginning and see how your filmography has paved the way to your latest. So really going way back here, what movies and shows were you watching when you were growing up? And now do you find that any of those past favorites are influencing the roles that you gravitate towards today? Um, the short answer to your question is, I would not say that any of what I was watching, I didn't have a TV for many, many years <clears throat> when I was um, young. And so I, I don't necessarily have the tradition of watching television in, in perhaps the same way that the, the, quite a few other people might. So I don't really have that um, uh, history and, and therefore, I can't necessarily make a direct connection to what I may have watched earlier in my life and um, how that impacts my choices. Now, what I will say is that actually, I am more impacted by some of the things I saw in the theater. Um, and that's had much more of an impact a direct impact, direct and in, direct and indirect impact. Not necessarily so much on my choices as an actor, but certainly in terms of <laughs> my belief that I could have a career as an actor in the first place. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but we just lost on the weekend a giant of the theater whose name was Douglas Turner Ward. And Douglas Turner Ward was the uh, artistic director for many, many years of the Negro Ensemble Company in New York City. Where, where are you based? Where are you guys? At the moment, I am in New York. Aha, uh -huh. okay. So I'm not sure how, as a, as a New Yorker or somebody who lives in New York, how aware you are of the Negro Ensemble Company and its history, but they were in the 60s, 70s, um, 80s, early to mid 80s, hugely influential in the theater. And in fact, uh, when I came back to New York uh, from studying at the American Conservatory Theater in San Francisco, the very first, I had two auditions set up. Uh, one was at the Public Theater, the New York Shakespeare Festival. And the other was, and I believe the very first audition was a, what we used to call a general audition for NEC. So the Negro Ensemble Company. I had seen a production, a Broadway production of the River Niger um, in 1973. And I told various of your colleagues that as a result of seeing that, when I walked out of the theater, I had an enhanced sense after having witnessed a group of black actors on stage in front of me with, I was sitting in the balcony with a, a, a group of black people in the audience, neither of which I had seen, neither of which I had experienced um, at that point in my life. And it was hugely impactful for me. And when I walked out of the theater, as a result of that experience, I had a, an enhanced sense that maybe somehow I could have a career as a theater, uh, as a, I'm sorry, I could have a career as an actor. Um, so I would say some of the things I saw in the theater um, influenced me, impacted me much more directly rather than things I saw on television. So just to make sure I have that early timeline, right? When you were studying acting in school, 
at that point, did you have the ambition of being a screen actor and then the general opportunity at NEC came up and it kind of put you down that path instead? Not at all. I, I, I had no sense of wanting to become a screen actor. I had a sense of wanting to become an actor <clears throat> and I wanted very specifically to work in the theater because I <clears throat> had this sense and I would say that I am part of a generation of, of theater actors that had the sense in the past. And I would say this is in the um, mid to late 1970s. Um, but I would say that the, the ethos probably started much sooner than when I started working. And that, that ethos, that belief was that theater could change the world. And I certainly um, have modified that, um, that belief. Um, subsequent to, to, to that time, but I do believe that work can have an impact on, if not change the world per se, it can certainly have an impact on or in the world that one is a part of. So I wanted to become a theater actor. I was not thinking about the screen. And, um, and that desire to want to work as a screen actor came much, much later for me. So in that case, is one, what sparked that initial desire? And when the first on-screen opportunities rolled around, is there anything in particular that opened your mind up to those possibilities as well and the impact that that format can make? Okay. <clears throat> um, the various realizations and for want of a better term, maybe epiphanies regarding the impact that working in film working for the screen can have. I've had different realizations of that and, I'll, uh, uh, and I'll, I'll give you a kind of an anecdote. But to your question, um, uh, after working in the theater, my, 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 my career in the theater essentially started, um, I would say in 1980. And I worked almost exclusively as a New York based theater actor for the first 10 years of my career, pretty much ish from 1980 to 1990. In that period, um, as a New York based theater actor, every now and again, I would do small parts in TV shows or in um, films that would come to town to cast, but generally my work was in the theater. In approximately the mid 1980s, at which point I was working fairly consistently as a, as a theater actor. And I should stress to you that that work pretty much involved working in the regional theater in this country. Um, yes, I've, I've been on Broadway a couple of times. <clears throat> yes, I've played off Broadway uh, a, a few times, but broadly speaking, generally speaking, a lot of the work that I did was in the regional theater. Um, and I came to the realization probably in the mid 1980s, even though I was working fairly consistently in the theater, that I needed to make more money. I needed to make more money, one. And I also had a very clear sense that if I wanted to expand my career as an actor, I needed to work for the camera, which at that point meant for me working in quote unquote, television and film. The reason that I came to that realiza realization, aside from the money, the reason that creatively quote unquote, I came to that realization is because what was happening for me was that when films, for instance, would come to New York to cast, I felt that the New York theater actors, while they had the respect creatively, would invariably just get 
um, the opportunity to audition for the smaller parts, what we used to call bit parts, that would work one or two days on a particular film. And I felt, uh, certainly that was my experience, um, that, that they were the kinds of opportunities, though they were few and far between, but when I did get an opportunity to audition for something in film, it was invariably a smaller role. And I felt two things. I felt I was, even at that point in my career, better than the opportunities that were being given to me to audition. And I felt um, that if I continued in that paradigm, just staying in New York, auditioning when I got the chance for these smaller parts that would come in to New York to cast, I, I started to feel like I was a little bit on a treadmill um, and that I didn't really see the opportunities that I could broaden my career. So I would say that happened around the mid 1980s um, that I came to that, that realization. And, I, and, and interestingly, I would say to you that the realization was creative rather than, oh, I need to make more money. That was certainly part of it, but it was a creative realization. Oh, if I want to grow my career, expand my career as an actor, I, I need to somehow start working for television and film. And in that regard, the theater <laughs> and a couple of parts that I did in the theater fed directly into the opportunities in film that came to me a little later. So it was all, it, it was all generated by my work uh, in the theater. So given what you're saying about the creative drive and also the financials of it all, and this mm -hmm. is something I'm always interested in hearing about because I think in this industry, no matter what medium you work in, it's a very difficult thing to say no to an opportunity when it presents no itself. But of no course, question. you know, you said no to do the right thing. So with that particular example and maybe anything else like that that came your way, how do you find that balance between taking the opportunities you need to forge forward, but also saying no to things that don't speak to you? In the mid 1980s, I had an extraordinary creative period in the theater. I went to the Kennedy Center, DC, the Eisenhower Theater in, 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 in DC uh, as part of the Kennedy Center with a production of uh, A Raisin in the Sun. I was, I was playing Walter Lee in A Raisin in the Sun, one of the great parts. It was an extremely successful production. As a result of the success of that production, we took the production to Los Angeles and we played at the Wilshire Theater on Wilshire Avenue. Again, very, very um, successful. As a result of that, I went in and auditioned and received an offer to play a part in a TV show that was just starting at the time called Beauty and the Beast. Uh, Ron, can't remember the actor's name and he's a good actor and, I'm, and I'm, I'm embarrassed right now. He played the beast and then the Hamilton played the beauty. Um, so I got this part in Beauty and the Beast and I did the first episode. I then went back to New York and, or I did an episode, <clears throat> maybe I think it was the pilot episode. But then I went to do, after doing Walter Lee in the theater, I then went to do a play called Joe Turner's Come and Gone, a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant play by August Wilson. Um, so I had this experience of doing Walter Lee Younger in the theater. Then I did this TV show, this pilot. Then I did... Um, Joe Turner's come and gone. In the theater, 
I was being I, I was being challenged to do these great great parts. The character I played in Joe Turner's Come and Gone, his name is Harold Loomis, about a man looking for his wife. By extension, the play is about African descended people looking for themselves on the American con uh, in America. All right, I think I did two productions regionally of Joe Turner's Come and Gone. I then got an opportunity to audition in Los Angeles for a film that Nick Nolte was doing. And I can't remember the name of the film, but I had I auditioned in New York for this film. They flew me out to Los Angeles for a for a, a callback audition. It was a bizarre experience. It was just bizarre. We don't have time to go into it, but it was just a really bizarre experience. I didn't get the part. And I remember sitting on the plane, flying back to New York, thinking about this audition that I had done. What was that? I was just, what was that? But what saved me was that I was going to do another production of Joe Turner's Come and Gone. I had that. I then got a call from the producer of Beauty and the Beast. His name was Ron Coslow. And Ron wanted me to come back and do another episode of Beauty and the Beast. And the timeline conflicted with my commitment to go and do this next, the following production of Joe Turner's Come and Gone, and I said no. There is an, and he could not understand it. I, I said, Ron, I, I, I can't. Ron Coslow had been very, very gracious toward me. Um, he wanted me to come back and do this episode. And as I weighed the creative dividend of going to do another episode of Beauty and the Beast compared to the creative dividend of doing Harold Loomis uh, uh, in Joe Turner's Come and Gone, there simply was no comparison. So I turned down going back to do another episode of, of Beauty and the Beast. I stayed with the production of Joe Turner's Come and Gone, which ended up uh, going to Broadway. Spike Lee saw me on Broadway in Joe Turner's Come and Gone, which started the connection, the relationship between myself and Spike. That's a very long-winded answer. I hope you followed it but it's pertinent to your question. It is an important story for the whole purpose of Collider Connected, so I appreciate you sharing that. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm taking a very big leap forward, but you just brought up earlier the idea of bit parts in movies and shows, and the thing that came I don't to like that term. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I hate that term. It's, 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 it's insulting to actors and the process. But you know, smaller parts, parts that, that played in, in in films for one or two days, you know, yeah. those kinds of parts. Yes. I, I respect that shift there quite a bit. The mm -hmm. movie that came to mind when you were explaining that was The Devil's Advocate, because yeah. I don't necessarily know how the behind the scenes of credits work, but I look at that and I wonder why you're uncredited in yeah. that movie. And I wonder if it has anything to do with the size of the role. No, it has absolutely nothing to do with the size of the role. Um, I had worked with Taylor Hackford, the director of The Devil's Advocate. I had worked with Taylor on a film called uh, Blood In, Blood Out. Um, and uh, we shot on San, uh, among other locations, which I shot on location in San Quentin. Um, and uh, Taylor called me and asked me to do this part in Devil's Advocate. And I looked at the part and by that time, and I'm not sure what year Devil's Advocate was. 97. <laughs> Okay, so at that point, I, I, was, I was working in film more consistently. And it wasn't that the part was not interesting. I just felt, when Taylor called me and asked me to do that, I just felt I had, 
I was I was doing you know larger parts, more substantial parts on film, and so I graciously I did two things. I graciously declined um, his offer, but I also recommended another actor to Taylor. I said, Taylor, I, I, I'm, I'm going to pass on this, man, but why don't you cast, and I, I named an actor that I had worked with, and I said, why don't you cast this guy? He's really good. He'll be great in this part, et cetera. For whatever reason, it did not work. It didn't work out with that other actor. Taylor came back to me and said, man, do me a favor. I, mean, I really want you to do this part. So I did it. Um, I was very well paid for one day of work. And I don't remember the specifics of why I, 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 I think the reason I, I am uncredited in the film is because my agent at the time, um, wonderful agent, brilliant agent, said, you know what, because it is a smaller part uh, and, and how, you know, how are they going to, and Delroy Lindo, how, how are we going to figure out the, the billing on this? So the, and we, we kind of sort of couldn't figure out the billing because I was coming to the project late and maybe the and position was already taken. I don't remember, but we, for whatever reason, we couldn't figure out the billing. So he said, look, the, the work you've been doing, you know, and at that point I had done Malcolm X, I had done Crookton, I had done Get Shorty, I had done Clockers. So at that point he said to me, look, people will know it's you. So just take an uncredited, do the job, do the work and just don't take a credit. Nobody's going to say, who's that actor? I mean, they, they will know you. You're, 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 you're well known enough. You can afford to be uncredited. And I, I also, so that's the reason that I was uncredited. And also at that time, the mid 1970s, 1977, uh, 1997, there was a kind of a trend of certain actors being uncredited in certain films. So that, that's why I was, un I, I was uncredited. I have to take a step back. And if I have my timeline right, it's two years because I watched Congo a lot. The line in this house that is repeated from that movie the most. I know what the line is. Stop eating my sesame cake. Yes. <laughs> I, I'm like, I'm totally serious in asking you this. What was that scripted? And how do you figure out how to nail uh, the delivery of a line of dialogue like that? Because it, it is iconic. Yeah, it's become a thing, huh? Um, I'm fairly certain that it was scripted. Um, and it was another instance in which I was very well paid for literally one day of work. Um, um, when I first was offered that part, I believe it was going to shoot in the Dominican Republic. And they said, and the producer said, look, uh, will you come do this part? Um, uh, we're shooting in the Dominican. Um, you can bring your wife, you know, you can film for a day or two on the film and then you can spend some time in the Dominican Republic. And I said, oh, great. Fantastic. Yes, I'll do the part. Um, time evolved and we ended up shooting in Pasadena. Um, uh, <laughs> I did get to bring my wife, but we went to Pasadena and not the Dominican Republic. Um, but the line was scripted. And it was one of those things where I just went in and um, did the work that was in front of me. It was really good actors in the cast. Um, and we just worked and it just happened. And it's one of those things that has become, you know, your word is iconic. It's become a thing. I, I'm, I'm clear it's become a thing. And it's the connection that many, many people make for my contribution to that film. It's not even that line, though. Your entire sequence, your delivery kind of carries it. I mean, liar, liar, saying more. It's like teeny tiny little things that could be insignificant like that. You make sure it becomes like an earworm of sorts because of the way you deliver it. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And perhaps to my earlier point, right, of, of not referring to bit parts, you know, it, I, I guess it's an example of how an actor, how any of us invests in the words that are in front of us in a script 
and that will dictate what you get out of it as an actor in terms of the creative process, but also the potential impact on audiences. You always do that. I feel like I'm jumping so far ahead, but I want to All save right. a chunk of time for the five bloods. But another one that really intrigues me on your resume is up because I don't know, I would have thought that your filmography would have been filled with voice acting opportunities. So how did Up come along and was voice acting something you had been interested in prior to that offer? Voice acting absolutely was something I was and am interested in prior to that offer. And it came to me and I've never had a I've never had a voice agent. Either. I've never been with an agency that pushed that aspect of what I potentially have. And I've also never had a voice agent who could do that. So the voice work that I've done has been very, very, very intermittent and sparse. But having said that, I am really glad I did up um, for a variety of reasons. Um, And and it came to me, Um, the uh, Pixar um, basically, you know, made that offer to me. And I remember them saying, um, you know, you know, how do you, how do you feel about playing a dog? And, and I, I had to think about that. And as, as they presented the script to me, and as I recall, it's, it's strange working as a voice actor in a Pixar film, in as much as you're not seeing the finished product. You're seeing drawings, you're seeing uh, bits of, of um, the narrative and the, and the material, but it's in, in the form of drawings. And um, I thought about what playing a dog, well, I, I guess I'm okay with it. I'm, I'm, what do you guys have in mind? And we talked about it and we talked it out. And by the time we had had a, a back and forth discussion, I decided that, okay, sure, I can, I can do that. But the answer to your question is, um, um, yeah, I'm, I'm very much interested in continuing to do voice work. I would like to see it happen even with all your experience up to that point, is there anything new you learned about your craft by stripping the physicality away and only being able to focus on the voice work? Great question. Yes, yes. Um, I guess what I learned, that process involves having a dependence on the instrument and having a dependence on the imagination, my own imagination to um, bring together the, the journey of the, of the character. And, 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 what, and that's not very clear. If I'm looking at a drawing, literally a drawing on a screen of what my character will potentially look like, I am then presented with the, um, what we call the, 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 the circumstances of the story at a given time and how I am then connecting to the circumstances in the story, how I am connecting to the narrative as it unfolds, it is then incumbent on me as the creative person to flesh that out and bring to it as much emotional vitality and as much emotional life as I am able, even in that relatively bare bones setting. But what I am depending on ultimately is my own creativity to bring it alive. Um, and I, that's, a, that's a test for any actor, it's a challenge, but um, I guess I, I don't know if I, I guess I learned that I am able to do that. And that does speak to, um, I don't know, my training, the years that I've worked and everything that I bring to a given creative situation. I'm eager to see you do that again. I'm eager to do it again. The Five Bloods, I, I kind of think I know the answer to this one, but when you first signed on for that role, what was the part of it that required you to, I guess, do the most work in order to be able to connect to Paul fully? 
the answer is maybe not quite what you think. I mean, certainly I know you've read the, the, the Trumpian hesitancy that I had, and that was work in, in terms of getting my head around rationalizing how the character could have cast that vote in 2016. So that's one aspect. But I would say the work, there was a huge amount of work for me uh, from the standpoint of deconstructing the condition of uh, PTSD, which is fundamental to Paul, which is um, part of what, uh, a major part of what Paul is struggling with and negotiating. And so that involved um, meeting and talking with vets, reading um, literature and, 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 and watching film. So the, the, the work there was uh, a central part of the, what I call, you know, the research process leading up to and continuing, leading up to production and continuing throughout production. But I would say that the conversations that I had with various vets, um, the first two of whom were my cousin that I've talked about a lot, my two cousins that I have uh, who were vets, um, that, was the, that was a lot of the meat of the preparation to do that work. Um, tr getting to terms with, okay, how has PTSD affected what are the effects, what are the impacts of PTSD on these various people that I spoke with? How do I translate that into Paul's experience, incorporate that into this character I'm creating? So throughout the movie, as you're expressing that, I mean, Paul really requires you to be at, I guess, an 11 from start to finish. There are so many scenes in this movie that I imagine are immensely challenging. Uh, the argument with Otis, the landmine sequence, the shootouts, the, the monologues you deliver straight to camera of all of that. Is there any particular one that made you circle that day on the filming schedule and say that day is the one that intimidates me the most? No. Um, and I, no, I, I don't say that from the standpoint of being arrogant. Um, I, I was not intimidated. I'll tell you something. I was not intimidated, A, because I, I, I trusted my preparation. I trusted the work that I had done to prepare. And that is not to say when I walked on set, I was thinking to myself, oh, I'm prepared. It was not that, it was just, I trusted those aspects of my process, but I also had a director in Spike Lee who trusted me and created a safe space for all of us to work. Therefore, there was no single day that said, ooh, I'm intimidated by that. Certainly there were days that were, that contained big scenes, but the trust that had been established, my trust in the way that I was working, the way that I was approaching the work and the trust that Spike Lee places in me all of those things are huge positives to make the overall process of doing the work safe. And, and honestly, uh, intimidation is not a word that I would use, um, being intimidated. Certainly challenged, challenged, but I had a sense that, look, clearly had things not been going well or had things been such that Spike was um, dissatisfied with anything that I or any of the rest of us were doing, he absolutely would have made that known and he didn't. So there was a, there was a smoothness to the, un that's not the most appropriate word. There, there was a, one felt that the, the, the I use, analogy, um, I use the analogy sometimes of a train. One felt that the train was going in the direction that it needed to go in and that we were all on it together and Spike was at the helm and he was uh, appreciating what he was getting in terms of the serving of the narrative. Does that make sense? Absolutely. 
you also spoke of safety on set Mm -hmm. from Spike as a leader. And I always love asking about what you get from your co-stars as well. And the moment that I wanted to focus on was the forgiveness beat between you and Chadwick and what he can do for you in an emotional moment like that to best support you and bring the most out of your work. What you can do, what Chadwick did and what you can do is hold up your end of the scene. <laughs> there are two of us in the scene. I've got my, I have to hold up my end and the other actor has to hold up his or her end. And what you can do is hold up your end. Additionally, in addition to holding up your end, what extra can you bring to elevate the work? And it, it's very interesting. Um, Chadwick's, Chadwick's wife, now wife, Simone, said something to me about that scene a few days after we had shot it. And it was just something I, in terms of the impact of the scene on her and all of the people who were watching us work. And it just hadn't occurred to me in those kinds of terms. She said, and I said, oh, wow, <laughs> thank you. Um, she said it was magical. And <laughs> it, 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 she said it was magical watching it, watching us. And um, what more can an actor ask for in the work than to have that kind of impact on uh, anybody watching. And the fact that it was, um, as I have talked about frequently at this point, the fact that it, that, was, that it was Chadwick's first day of work just enhanced exponentially my appreciation of the whole the scene, the day, the work in general. It was his first day of work. I had been working for five, six weeks at that point. And he showed, he showed up and not only did he hold his end up of the scene, he contributed um, over and above what was on the written page. That is what any actor can do to contribute to the work of his or her scene partner in a scene. I've seen him create that magic in two different movies now over the past year. And to even be able to feel like a little bit of that spark is so greatly appreciated. Appreciated, And I'm just like, I'm in awe of his ability. I do want to highlight some of your other co-cast right now because The Five Bloods does feature one of my favorite ensembles of the past year. So of everybody that you're working opposite here, who would you say has a process that's most similar to yours? And then who challenged you to adapt the most? Each of the styles of acting that we brought to this work were quite seamlessly incorporated into what, what each of us was doing. Does that make sense? Absolutely. In terms of who challenged me to, uh, no, whose work is similar to my own, um, I can't answer that fully, but I will say that Jonathan Majors, before we started working, Jonathan said, hey man, can, can I get your number? A couple of things I wanna to talk to you about. And I said, sure, man. And I was working, I was in production on something else, but I said, sure. And we and Jonathan and I talked. And Jonathan asked me a couple of questions having to do with the history, our history as father and son. And ironically, I couldn't answer the, his questions at that time because I didn't know enough about, about the character. I was, you know, hadn't started quite creating yet. But the fact that he asked me the questions that he asked me led me to understand that, um, who a given character is before the audience sees him in the story 
is important to Jonathan, answering certain questions about who is this person. Um, and that is something that is uh, very important for me, that I answer those questions um, for myself and that I have knowledge of the character, that I know who this person is um, before, the, uh, before I, I open my mouth and start speaking in whatever scene. So the fact that Jonathan asked me those questions suggests to me that he has a similar approach in terms of history of the character he's playing or biogra certain biographical de details that are important to him to answer for himself. Now, I got in the habit the last few years of asking this a lot this time of year because personally, I can't get enough of award season. I love the opportunity to celebrate people's work and accomplishments. I love how recognition like this can open doors that weren't open before. They can inspire change. So for you personally, what does award season mean to you? Why is this time of year so special for the industry? What it means to me and why it's special to the industry are two, I think, very different things. I, 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 I concur with you with regard to it's, it's wonderful that actors get recognition for what, what they have done. It's unfortunate that I think it's important that it not become a competition, even though on some level we are competing. And that's the unfortunate part. But I would say that certainly from the standpoint of giving actors recognition, that's absolutely tremendous. And I, you know, I'm a member of the Academy. And so many, many years <clears throat> during award season, I, I, I oftentimes I, I get to watch extraordinary work. <clears throat> Excuse me, and that's um, really, really, you know, gratifying, rewarding, inspiring to see the depth and the breadth, the magnitude of the talent that's out there and on and on display. Kind of got to be frank about this last one here because <laughs> the Golden Globes are on my mind. We're recording this interview the day after the ceremony, so. What go I know what went my through my mind when I heard the nominations. What goes through your mind when there's so much positivity and buzz and support behind you, and then not only your personal nomination, but the Five Bloods is nowhere to be found in that nomination list because, like, it hurt me. I can't even imagine how it made you and the team feel. It reminded me that certain pockets of the industry, certain pockets of this process are still a business. And it being a business, the connection between the business and the creative aspect do not always align. And I was reminded of that very starkly, very acutely in that moment that the uh, nominations for the Golden Globes were announced. What is something actionable that you think folks in the industry could do to change that? Even when it's not an, or it's not an organization that you're necessarily a part of, I always think it's worthwhile talking about the possibilities to at least spark that change. Right, and, and again, I think that is an entirely legitimate question um, it's very difficult for me to answer that question this year as it, as it relates to the Golden Globes, because I feel that anything that I say will be seen as sour grapes, perhaps, and I'm not trying to set myself up to be assessed in that regard. You know, interestingly, perhaps if you, if I were not so directly involved in, in awards season this year, and on another year, I, I might be able to answer that more quote unquote objectively. Um, but having said that, I will say that I, I hope it is being looked at, not just in terms of me, because the fact is, as you know, if you're an award season fan, you know that every single year there are worthy performances that get ignored 
I mean, the thing, and, I, and I, maybe I'll get in trouble for saying this, but I cannot understand at all how Alfre Woodard's work last year in Clemency was not lauded uh, more widely. Every year it happens that there are worthy performances that for whatever reason don't get the recognition. So as it relates to this year, I think this year is particularly egregious. And I think, and I can only hope that that process is deconstructed and looked into. Because if you're going to call yourself a legitimate awards giving organization, then how are you functioning? What are you recognizing and why? Now, they may say, well, we don't have to answer that question. And you're right, you don't. You don't, quote unquote, owe me or perhaps anybody else that. But when um, it involves such a seemingly blatant um, non-reaction, if you were hurt as, a, as, a, as an observer, <laughs> I really should stop. Because yeah, I know what you mean. Um, I, I just think you ask a legitimate question. I think it is a legitimate question to say, okay, what's, what's going on here? What's really going on here? And smarter minds than myself will perhaps answer that question or investigate that. I appreciate you sharing what you did. And for what it's worth, I am rooting for you and for this movie so hardcore for anybody out there who is yet to see the five bloods. What are you waiting for? It's streaming on Netflix. You can go check it out and then come jump on a uh, team Delroy here. I am so happy for you. Congratulations on all of your success, your success with the five bloods and for everything I know that is to come for you. I appreciate your time today. God bless you. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate it.